Uh, my name is One. Uh, if we haven't met, um, I get the privilege of, of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship. Um, and we start a brand new series uh, this morning. It's going to uh, take us 16 weeks to get through it. We're going to do, uh, do it in two kind of uh, portions. We'll do the first eight weeks, and then we'll take a five-week break, and then we'll finish it up in the next eight weeks. And so we're going to be in the book of Psalms, if you haven't uh, figured that out. Um, yeah, we're going to be in the book of Psalms, and I'm really, really excited about it uh, for so many reasons. Uh, we thought about this last year, and we've been praying about it, and it's like, well, in our year of worship, because that's uh, the year that we're in. Uh, we've said 2024 for us is the year of worship, where we want to just lay it all at the feet of Jesus uh, in view of His great mercy to say, we just want to worship you. Um, and, and I couldn't think of a, a better book to dive into uh, than the book of Psalms, because uh, the book of Psalms has, has so much kind of raw human emotion, right? So it's easy to go, look, I'm going to worship Jesus with everything. I'm so excited. And then you walk out through those doors and then life hits you in the face at 200 kilometers per hour. And you're like, what on earth is going on? Uh, what am I to do? Where am I to go? And I really believe that the book of Psalms answers a lot of those questions. Um, it allows us to, to be human uh, as we come to our Lord and Savior, asking Him to uh, rescue us, to help us, to give us strength, to heal us. All those things that we are in need of, I believe we can find them in the book of Psalms. And so here's what we've done. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and so we have created a devotional uh, that will help you kind of walk through our sermon series. Um, and so every week uh, as you come here and you hear the word preached, then uh, during the rest of that week, then what you can do is open up your devotional and walk through that particular psalm that was preached. And there's a couple of questions there for you. And just really uh, make the most of our study together. And so uh, if you've ordered one, uh, then you should go to the Sabona table. Uh, they'll have your physical hard copy there for you. Uh, if you didn't, don't panic, don't worry. We have a PDF version for you. Um, and so you can just go to our website, rootedfellowship.com, hit the resources page, uh, and it should be there ready for you to download, all right? So that's the Psalms devotional. You can, you can send this to whoever you want. Um, if you've got an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a brother, a friend, you can just say, hey man, use this as an opportunity to go, listen, I want to talk to you a little bit about Jesus at our church. We're walking through the book of Psalms. Maybe you and I can do this every week, right? We can read the Psalms together and then just kind of walk through the devotional. And so use it as an opportunity to uh, share the good news of Jesus with your one more, okay? So I just wanted to make mention of that. And then Next week, Sunday, is what we're calling Commitment Sunday, all right? Commitment Sunday. Uh, if you've been with us for a while, you'd remember uh, that we are on a two-year discipleship journey on generosity, all right? There's a whole thing. Uh, I don't have time to get into it. If you want to know more about it, go to the Sabona table or head over to our website, uh, www.rootedfellowship.com. Uh, hit the generosity tab and all the information that you need to know about our two-year discipleship journey will be there. But here's the thing. Uh, if you got one of these cards, uh, we, we encouraged you to go home, pray, uh, pray about what it is that you believe God's calling you to generously bring in this year and then write it out here on this commitment card and then put it in this box. And I've seen some of you do that. I'm very thankful. Uh, that's great. Um, but next week, Sunday, we're calling it Commitment Sunday because uh, we're just going to pray. We're going to pray over uh, this two-year discipleship journey um, and then bring your cards, put them in, and then we're going to take this box over to our finance manager who I believe, I think Pastor Wade made this box. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's a screw uh, that only she has and she'll be able to, yeah, yeah, okay, so no one can open it. It's pretty cool. I hope that's true. Otherwise, uh, you've just made me a liar in front of everyone. Um, so let's take it as if it's true. And, uh, and so it'll go to her and then she'll just kind of take them all out and um, and then what we want to do is come back to you and say, hey, listen, here's, here's where we are. Now, I know this will constantly change uh, as the year goes on, as more people become part of Rooted Fellowship, as more people go, hey, listen, I want to be a part of this two-year discipleship journey in generosity. But we just wanted to give you a quick update. Here's where we are, right? In the, in the last few weeks, uh, we've been doing this, and here is where we are. And so next week, Sunday, Commitment Sunday, if you haven't filled out your card and brought it and put it in, I'd encourage you to do so next week, Sunday. Is that cool? Make sense? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. We're in the book of Psalms. Um, and we've, uh, we've called this sermon series uh, Psalms Mixtape. Um, and uh, I don't know, depending on how old you are, it was quite funny. We're busy singing because there's quite a, quite a few tapes in the artwork. 
uh, our seven-year-old leans over to me and goes, oh, Papa, what is, what is that? Um, and that, it was in that moment I realized, oh, wow, we are in a completely different generation. Um, but we've called it a mixtape because we're not going to go through every single psalm, um, but we've picked out a few and we said, listen, let's, let's take these and just kind of go deeper into them. Um, and so we'll treat uh, this 16 weeks like a, like a mixtape, if you will. Uh, so, some of the best that we find in the book of Psalms. Now, hear me, all of them are amazing. Um, but we just took out a few. And, and, and so uh, it's the mixtape, right? I would love to have gone through every single one, but we'd still be here three years from now, especially the way that we preach here at Rooted, Lan Balan. Um, and, and so we've picked out a few. Uh, and we hope that one of them, and I'm pretty sure many of them will, uh, will, will meet you where you are. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, high, low, good, bad. Uh, there's a psalm for you that God is speaking to you. He wants to engage you where you are because he's a loving father. And so we're going to kick off our series in Psalm 1, right? The very, very first one. But here's what I'm going to do. Before I read it and jump in, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, that God would do a work that only he can do, and that is save many. And so, Father God, we, we come asking uh, that you would do this very thing, that you would lead, that you would guide, uh, that you would soften our hearts and open them up so that we might receive from you. I pray against the evil one whose uh, desire is to steal, kill, and destroy, but you come to give life and give it to the full. And so may we experience this abundant life. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Psalm, Psalm 1. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It should be up on the screen as well. Hear these words of our Father. It says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He, he is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Now, I like how the, the Christian Standard Bible, the translation that I just read to you, I, I love how it phrases the opening. In fact, I believe that that is the correct translation. Now, I know, depending on what you have in front of you, uh, many other translations begin this psalm this way. Blessed is the man. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I love how the Christian Standard Bible has put it. You see, this, this blessing means being supremely happy or fulfilled. It's a, a deep sense of, of well-being. How happy is the one? Uh, this is not a superficial happiness that, that comes and goes. That's, that's not what the psalmist is talking about here. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a happiness that's connected to our happenings. It's massively different. You need to understand that. It is, it is not a happiness that is connected to our happenings, but rather a deep sense of joy from God's grace in your life. It is a, 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 a blessed that is, that is characterized by happiness and being highly, highly favored. It's probably where folks get that, how are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Anybody say that this morning? Great, great. Because you should. You should. If you believe what the Word of God says, then you, you should. Look, I, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I, I, I don't care what your background is. I don't care where you're from. I don't even care what you believe. Because at the core of every single one of us, that is what we want. I'm telling you, I've, I've never met someone who goes, you know what, I don't want to be blessed and highly favored. I just don't. At the core of who we are, that is what we want. And, and I, I mean, I know that we're in church and, and, you know, but can we be honest for a moment? Can, can we pull down the mask? Can we stop pretending and performing? 
and just go, man, that's, that's what I want. To be blessed and highly favored. That happiness, I want that. See, Psalm 1 offers us true, lasting happiness by presenting a, a series of contrasts between the, the righteous and, and the wicked. See, it, it describes two kinds of people living two kinds of lives with two kinds of outcomes. See, when, when we see the, the blessings of, of the godly next to the emptiness of the wicked, this stark contrast is, is, is supposed to, to move us towards the good shepherd. That, that when we look at it and we go, listen, let, let's just evaluate what's going on here. The, the psalmist is hoping that that would move us to go, you know what, I want to choose life. And, and not just any life, I want to choose the abundant life. See, the, the blessings God pours out are, are, are so beautiful and, and, and so compelling that, that any sane human being would go, yeah, that's what I want. And, and, and deep down, they, they do. You know what the problem is? It's actually, I, I want to decide how I get there. That's the issue. So, so even as you're talking to, to those who, who say, you know what, I, I, I'm not a Christian. I, 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 don't know, I don't know if I believe that God exists. Th then take a few steps back and go, okay, but do you, do, do you want happiness? Do, do you want to, dare I say, be blessed and highly favored? And if they are honest, they'll go, yeah, I do. Then, then you go, then listen, what, what we believe is that there is only one way to that. And, and, and look, man, and, and I'm telling you, I've done this before. Like, I'll take out a piece of paper and go, listen, happiness. I'll write on the one side, happiness. And then I go, now let's write all the things that you have done to try to achieve that, and let's talk about how it's going. It doesn't take too long before, and, and again, if you're honest, it doesn't take too long before you go, you know what, that's not working, that didn't work. That was a horrible, horrible thing to do. So it's not that we don't want happiness. The problem is that like, we, we want to decide how to get there on our own terms. So, Psalm 1 is the, it's the, it's, it's the introduction to the book of Psalms. And, and it's, it's here that, that, that we should see the, the blessings God promises to those who love His Word. We're going to get into it. But, but you cannot separate God from His Word. And so he goes, listen, you, you want to you wanna bless life? Man, you've, you've got to value the word. You've got to value the word. It's to those who continuously come to the word. It's, it's those who, 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 who seek it out. It's, it's those whose souls are awakened to the wonder of God. Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is the, is the appropriate first track in our selection of psalms. See, as we, as we unpack track after track after track, I hope you see what I'm doing, mixtape track, okay, cool. <laughs> track after track after track, that, 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 that all of this would, 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 would point us to God. The promises of God meant for those who cherish His word are, are, are meant to make us realize that, listen, I am loved more than I could ever imagine. Loved more than I could ever imagine because of the finished work of Jesus. And so it, it starts this way. How happy is the one. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. I hope you see the, the downward spiral of these negative descriptions. They, they are progressively getting worse. This is the progression of sin. See, this should remind us uh, that, that, that no one, no one, hear me, no one just falls into sin. Like I hear it all the time, oh, I, just, I, just, I just fell into sin. I just, I just fell into adultery. I just fell into that addiction. I just, I just fell into greed. No, no, no one just falls into sin. There is a progression. I say this all the time. Sin 
will always take you further than you want to go. It'll always make you pay more than you can afford. And it'll always want you to stay there longer than you wanted to. How many of us go, you know what, I just, just, just this one time. I'm just going to do just this one time. And then I'm going to stop. Or, no, no, this is the last time. The, the kingdom of darkness loves that because it, it's like, you think it's a negotiation, but it's not. It's a hostile takeover. So, sin's going, okay, I'll, what do I need to tell you to believe that lie? No problem. Just one last time. Come, let's go. It's the last time. I mean, you know what? Even I'll walk you back. That's the promise. That I, I will walk you back. No problem. And then months later, you're like, I don't know how I got here. Like my life's in ruins. How, how did I end up here? the progression of sin. And the psalmist, right out the gates, I mean, he's, he's, he's given us the, the kingdom of darkness's playbook. He's like, listen, you want to be happy? Here's, don't do this. Don't go there. Walk. Stand. Sit. Walk. Stand. Sit. See, first, first you, you'll be influenced by the world in your thinking. That's how it begins. You walk in the advice of the wicked. Friends, can I tell you that the quickest way to live a miserable life is to take counsel from people who care absolutely nothing about God. Yeah. I know, I know. Some of you are already pushing back. Oh, no, are you saying that I can? That's not what I'm saying. No, 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 no. We take advice. Common grace, right? We take advice from, from, yeah, from people who don't know Jesus, like, I, don't know, I don't know if my financial manager is a Christian. I don't know, you're right? So, but that happens all the time. But, but, but when you start asking some deep fundamental questions and you go to the wrong person, obviously you're going to get the wrong result. It's the quickest way. Because you know what they're going to do? They, they're going to quote to you Second Opinions chapter 3. <laughs> so it's a great one, that one, huh? Because it's constantly changing. I love it. So postmodern. Or, or maybe they'll give you the, the gospel according to hashtag. And I know many of us, we eat that stuff up. What is my purpose to life? Well, let's see what Instagram has to say. That's how it starts. You, see, you start thinking because you're, you're in counsel with the wicked. Then secondly, you... You start behaving like the world in your doing. So, so the first one is in your thinking, but now all of a sudden, as this progressively gets worse, it's now in your doing. You stand in the pathway with sinners. It starts to get hard to distinguish whether you're a Christian or you're not. Like I hear you say these things, but your life looks different. And then lastly, you will belong in the world in your being. So, so thinking, then doing, then being. You, you sit in the company of mockers. Now, I read this and uh, look, I've walked through the psalm multiple times and I've gotten the massive privilege by God's grace to, to preach it and teach it over the years. But it was the first time when I looked at it and I was like, to sit in the company of mockers. And I went, yeah, 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 like, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm with mockers, right? I'm with those who, who don't believe in God. I'm, I'm believing the lies of, of the world and the kingdom of darkness. And so I'm, I'm now among them mocking the Christian, mocking those who say they put their trust in Jesus. But, but if, we, if we pulled back the curtain and, and we put on our, our kingdom eyes, you'll quickly realize that the mockers are mocking you. If, if, we, if, we, if we just went, you know what, let me, let, let, let me pull back the spiritual curtains. You'll see that the kingdom of darkness, while it, it may be like, yeah, hey, we're together, behind the scenes, they're laughing at you. That's how bad things have gotten. So, so then he says, don't, don't, don't do this but rather, verse two, instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. He meditates on it day and night. What makes you happy? I think it's a valid question. 
What, what makes you happy? What gets you excited? I mean, this, this is a good way to determine what's important to you. I mean, oftentimes you don't even have to ask. If I know you well enough, I can, I can go ahead and say like, man, you have, you have a high value for this. Well, why do you say that? Well, it's because you talk about it all the time. And not only do you talk about it all the time, you carve out time in your life to be able to do those things. You give resources to those things. I mean, if it's, if it's personal pleasure, if that's what makes you happy, then I'm here to tell you that, that you're probably a selfish, self-centered person. Sorry. Maybe for you, it's not. It's, it's family and friends. That's what delights you. I mean, that's a little better than yourself, but hear me, it still falls miserably short. It will not give you the happiness that, that God wants to give you. So what do you delight in? The, the psalmist says, the, the, the truly happy person, no matter the situation or the circumstance, that's important. No matter the, the situation or the circumstance is the one who does what? Delights in the Lord's instruction. It, it, it's the one who, who delights in the law of God. It's the one who, who, who loves the word of God. It's the one who loves the scriptures. They go, man, this, this is what I need. This is what I need. I hope, I hope that, that right out the gates, we're, we're able to put one and one together. Right? That, 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 that like we're reading between the lines as the psalmist is writing here. Because here's the thing. You, you cannot delight in something that you know nothing about or, or that you don't know that well. I, I, hope, you, I hope you're reading between the lines here. You, it's important. It's like... If, if that's you, then please come tell us how to do it. Be, because throughout history, we've all failed. Humanity has failed. us. You cannot delight in something that you know nothing about. And yet today, there, there, are, there are so many people, so many people who go, no, I, mean, I delight in the word of God. I delight in God. And, and then you hear them talk, and then you go, I, I think you and I are talking about a different God. You quickly realize that they actually don't know God's word. And, and if, like, so where are you going to go? If you want to know more about God, where are you going to go? And it's not just, it's not just like people in the church. It's, it's people who stand on platforms like this. That's how scary it is. That there are people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, they get up here and they go, I'm preaching, I'm preaching God to you. And you're like, but from where? That, that sounds more like a God of your personal imagination than a God of biblical revelation. And, and so that's what they do. They just keep giving you opinions. Here's my opinion about, here's how I feel. And I totally get it. Feelings, man, great. You know, they help us navigate through life. I say it all the time. Great. Here's how I feel. But you know what? Sometimes you're going to say, here's how I feel. And God's going to go, yeah, but that's not what I said. Yeah. And then we quickly go, yeah, you know, that... It was written so, so long ago. You know, it doesn't, culturally we have changed, you know. So, you know what you create? You create a postmodern God. That's just a nice way of saying you create a cult. Because that's what it is. So it's a postmodern God who, who he's, he's outdated. So, so now we have to, we have to make him relevant. The moment you have to make God anything, we, we're in deep waters. Oh, but I like, I like the God of the 80s. Now, that, that God, ew, that pumping, that, that's the God I want. Right? These young kids today, and I'm, and I'm saying it for myself. Like I realized yesterday, we're hanging out with some friends and I, I realized, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, that's why I like hanging out with uh, more mature, older people because then I'm just always young. But anyway, like, it's what they say. It's like, you know, the kids today, they just, you know, the God of the 80s. What are you talking about? Have you failed to recognize that God, God lives outside of our time? 
That's the God that we serve. He, he exists outside of our space. It's not to say that he cannot come into our time and come into us. In fact, he does it all the time. But it's the same God. Same God. And so where, where, you want to know him? Where are you going? I'm all for commentaries. I read them all the time. I'm all for books written by uh, other believers and Christians. There's some great stuff out there. I'm all for it. But there's nothing, that nothing, nothing that will come close to the word of God. Let me, let me, one, one more, one more. Because God will never, we're talking about this this morning. God will never say something to you in private that contradicts what he said publicly. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that God can do whatever he wants. Right now, in this very moment, he could be whispering in your ear. He can. And it could be, as, it, it could be so loud. It's because he's talking to your heart. Yeah. But hear me. Like, I, I get it all the time. God, God spoke to me. What did he say? Because I'm excited. What did he say? And then, and then you say it, and, then you, and you go, but wait, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 wait. Say, say that again. Maybe, maybe say, say, say it in your, in, in your home language. Maybe the English is not Englishing, but what did he say? And then, you, and then they say, and you're like, yeah, no. I, God would never say that. It goes against who he is. His character, his nature, his being. That one was for free. Yeah, take that one. They delight in, in the word of God. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says. I love Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was that guy that just says whatever he wants. You know what I mean? And it's, it's always anchored in the, I love him. And if you don't know Charles Spurgeon, go Google him. Old, old, he's dead, he's dead, it doesn't matter. Anyway, here's what he says. He says, true Bible readers and Bible searchers never find it wearisome. They like it least who know it least. And they love it most who read it most. They find it newest who have known it longest. And, and they find the pasture to be the richest whose souls have been the longest fed upon it. That's old school English, but man, it makes sense. Then it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just stop at knowing it, okay? H hear this. Because once you know it, then you've got to obey it. Yeah. Right? You've got to obey it. it. It serves you no purpose to, to intellectually know the word of God, but it has zero effect on your life. You want to be blessed? You want to be happy and highly favored by God? Then you've got to take steps of obedience in the direction of the good shepherd. You've got to take steps of obedience in the direction of the good shepherd. It simply means you've got to obey the word of God. Obey God. So many of us, so many of us, oh, I know, I know. Like even now, it's Psalm 1, you're going, oh, let me take a quick nap. I know Psalm 1, read it so many times. Uh, this is going to be great. Yeah, you might be the person who knows it. But if we take a magnifying glass and we look at your life, it's like, yeah, you don't know it. You've got to take steps of obedience in the direction of the good shepherd. Look, I, I know many of us in here have great intentions. Even now you're going, mm, you know what? Yes, this afternoon. <laughs> My intentions are strong. <laughs> but I need you to know it's, it's your direction, not your intention that determines your destination. Let me, let me say that again. It's your direction, not your intention that determines your destination. I, I, can, I can have all the intentions to go home after this. All the intentions. I can write about it. I can, I, can, I can pull someone up and say, can you pray for me? Because I have the intentions to go home this afternoon. I can go out there and talk about, look, there's no coffee today, but maybe if they want to grab a cup of coffee, buy you all coffee and go, you know what, guys? I have the intentions to go home this afternoon. But if I don't get in my car and turn it on, and do all the things with the legs 
and make my way out there. And if, like, if I, then I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to get to the destination. And they, the problem is there are so many, so many Christians today who go, I have all the intentions in the world, but zero direction. You can't just know the word of God. You've got to put it into practice. You've got to obey it. And then here we're told to meditate on it day and night. Day and night. So, so when other times, because I know there's someone here. So when other times can I not meditate on it? <laughs> not sure how you, you know how 24 hours works. We only have day and night. And then there's always that clever person. Oh, well, what about at dawn? You know, dawn, <laughs> dusk. Can I, you know? Don't be clever. Me- meditate on a day and night. The, the word meditate means, means to, to murmur or to mutter. It's to, to read it in an undertone. Th- this has the sense of, of, of talking to yourself, speaking under your breath as you reflect God's word, as you, as you massage it into your heart and you allow it to marinate in your life. I promise never to uh, say anything about our, our vegan um, brothers and sisters. And I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to keep my word. So um, I like meat. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. I love meat. I really do. And, and, and I know that if I want to get the best flavor from that steak, uh, when I put it on the fire and I, I pull it off, it's, well, it's to marinate it the day before. It's to allow those, those spices to make their way into every part of that meat. If we're willing to do that with meat, I have no idea why we wouldn't do that with the Word of God. Maybe we care more about our bellies than we do our souls. Meditate on it day and night. This, this is also what my high school teacher, and I don't know if she's listening, but thank you, Mrs. Zinth. This is what my high school teacher would also call an imperfect verb. You learn theology and sequoia here at Rooted Fellowship, which is English, English. It's an imperfect verb, which indicates that this is a continual action. To meditate on a day, and it is a continual action action. It's not a one and done. No, no, no. Friends, hear me. We study, we consider, we examine, we investigate, we ponder, we reflect, we marvel over God's word. You know, so I, I had a guy come once. Um, they were looking to plant a church and, and, and wanted to see what we were doing. And, and they came through and they were like, yeah, it's really cool. It's nice. Music's uh, nice. Yeah, the space is cool. I like what you did to the whole. But it's like, wow, man, you guys, you guys are really about the word, huh? You know? Oh, I mean, like, I think you could potentially shave 20 minutes off your message. But it's because you, you guys are about, like, literally, line by line, literally, you guys are really about the word. And I went, like, yeah, what else would we be about? This is more than a book club. Way more than a book club. We we marvel over the word of God. We we want to understand it. We want to grow in it. We want to hear what our Father is saying to us. Day and night. Day and night. It should be, the word of God should be like a like a soundtrack to your favorite mixtape. A little bit on the nose? Okay, fine. Maybe you. It should, be, it should be like your favorite meal. Your favorite meal that you, that you, you eat over and over and over again. See, see, the word of God releases its flavor as you chew on it over time. Imagine a, a, a chewing gum that had a three-course meal in it. No, no, no Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fans. Okay, cool, no problem. No problem. I'll leave that one alone. Skip it. Or go watch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's really good. Yeah, it's not a bad movie. But it should be like that. It should be like as you taste it, you're just going, wow, this is so good. I want more and more and more of it. As you, as you read one verse, it's like, ooh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting slow, uh, slow cooked smoked ribs barbecue flavor as you continue to read the next verse you're like ooh this no this is this is this is a uh, a tiramisu uh, with uh, brownie chocolate brownies like do you know what i mean 
I hope you get excited about the word of God. And hear me, if Sunday morning is your only meal of the week of the word of God, I'm here to tell you, you are very malnourished. I mean, if I said to you, hey, listen, you only need to eat one meal a day, you'll be good. I don't care what diet you are and what goals you have, you're going to die. And yet with the word of God, we're, we're comfortable. Many of us are comfortable to be like, Sunday, Sunday I'm just going to, you know, feed me, feed me on air, feed me. And then you get like, I'll see you next week. It's day and night. And if you're sitting here going, I don't even know where to begin, please come chat to us. Man, we'd love to give you a plan. We'd love to give you a reading plan. We'd love to journey with you. There's tons of resources and tools that are out there that help you walk through God's word. You are not alone. Even me, once upon a time, I was somewhere. I was in a group. I tell the story all the time. I was in a group and we're sitting there. We had a a Bible, my first ever Bible. And and it's like, hey, let's turn to the book of John. And I looked around. I saw everyone. (laughs) Professionals. (laughs) You know what I mean? And I'm sitting there going, there's a... There's a book in the Bible called John? Where, where's that? Uh, table of contents. That's where it all began for me. God will start and he will bring what he has started to completion. <sighs> Reflecting on the, on the Psalms has the power to awaken our hearts to discover joy in Christ. That's why. That's why we make much of God's word because we want you to to discover the beauty of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Okay, we've got to keep keep moving. Can you believe only third verse, what? He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now look, the the picture of a flourishing tree is, is, is a very powerful image here to describe the Christian's life. There's five, five points here that we can pull out, five things that stand out here. First, uh, this tree doesn't merely grow. You see that? It's planted. Look, trees, trees grow randomly in the forest, but it takes a, a landscape architect, a, a gardener, for a tree to be planted. The, the gardener plans where to plant the trees for height, for color, for shade, and for various other reasons. The point is this, that there is intention and purpose for this tree. In the same way, God chooses where to place us for our good and to bring order and beauty into his world. He has a plan, he has a purpose. So some of you might be going, I don't know why I'm in this church. God has a plan for you. And I get it, there may be things that you're like, "Mm, I don't particularly like that, Well, it's just how it is. You're not going to love everything. But the question is, am I growing? Am I planted? Am I, am, I, am I supposed to be where I'm supposed to be? There is a purpose and a plan to, to the life for the child of God that nothing in your life is random. If you say that you're a Christian, then nothing, nothing in your life is where you work, where you live, who your friends are, your upper, none of it is random. God has a plan. The this, this sense of God's formation grows in the second point on, on this, this, this flourishing tree. See, this happy person is, is planted, I hope you see this, is planted by a source of life. Beside flowing streams, the psalmist says. The the word streams is is communicated to make us think a river or a a channel or a canal. And in case you you think that we're just talking about agriculture and aquatics, we're not. This this person is beside Jesus. Go ahead and tell you. Beside Jesus who, who gives us living water. See, in his conversation to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, Jesus says this. He says, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, hear this, in fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Notice that he does, he does not say that he is the living water, but that he would give living water to her. 
It, it would be his gift to her if she receives it. And if she does, it'll lead to the abundant life. It'll lead to what the psalmist calls the, the, the blessed life. And so the question is, will you receive? Jesus wants to give you water, living water. Will you receive or will you continue to run to other, other things hoping that they will give you all that you need? Uh, John 7 verse 37 to, to 38 says, if, if anyone is thirsty, this is Jesus speaking, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, you've got to believe. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, I want to believe. Where do I go? To the scriptures to see what it says. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. See, to be, to be like a tree planted by streams of water is to be one who has has regular supply of nourishment and refreshment. And so my question to you this morning is, is do you feel starved? Are you exhausted? And I'm not just talking physical here, but I'm talking about your soul. Does your soul feel empty? Are you just doing the motions? Are you just doing it because that's what I'm supposed to do? If that's you, then here's a quick question. Where are you planted? Where are you planted? Look, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and tell you, right? I'll ask the questions and I'll answer them. It's great. You're not planted beside Jesus. If that's you, if you're going, man, I just feel, I feel the whole time, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's ongoing. Like I get seasons, but it's just ongoing. I, I'm just empty. Then you're not planted beside Jesus. Maybe you're trying to suck life from cash and credentials and comfort and the cares of this world. Let's keep moving. The, th the third point of this tree is that it bears its fruit in its season. See, as you delight and meditate on God's word, you will produce fruit in its season. What, what does this mean? Well, most trees do not bear fruit all year round. You will not bear fruit all year round. This is where I plug in community. This is why you need community. Because there are seasons in my life where I'm not bearing the fruit that I need. But you know what? I'm sitting next to someone who is. You cannot. You cannot bear fruit all year round. There are seasons. We who delight in God's word, who walk with God, We'll have, we'll have seasons of, of great fruit and seasons of greater fruit and then seasons of pruning. Where God is like, I want to do more in you, but, but I can't have you bear fruit here while I'm pruning you. He's, remember, he's the gardener. He's the one who has planted you. He knows what he's doing. And, and pruning is not a bad thing. I think sometimes we are ashamed of it. And so, you, you know, we do, we, in the pruning, we stay away when it's actually when you need to be here because I'm not bearing that fruit and so I need to be beside someone who is while God is pruning me so that I might bear more fruit and then when it's your turn for pruning, you're beside me. But what do we do? We're like, no, 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 I'm gonna stay away while the pruning is happening because I just want people to see me always when I'm bearing fruit, always when I'm flourishing. That's not how it works. Adam Clark says this, a godly education, and he's not just talking about like a Christian school. He's talking about when we meditate on God's word. A godly education under the influences of the divine spirit, which can never be withheld where they are earnestly sought. Gosh, I love that. God will not withhold himself from you if you earnestly seek him. A godly education under the influences of the divine spirit, which cannot, can never be withheld where they are earnestly sought, is sure to produce the fruits of righteousness. And they who read, pray, and meditate will ever see the work which God has given them to do, the power by which they are to perform it, 
and the times and places and opportunities for doing those things by which God can obtain the most glory. Their own soul is most good and their neighbor is most edified. What's Adam saying? He's saying, listen, if you're out here going, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know, am I supposed to be here? Am I not supposed to be here? If you're so confused, the problem is that you are not in his word walking with God because if you keep your eyes on him, it doesn't matter where you are and what you're doing, you're doing his will. You're doing his will. You see, the godly person produces thanksgiving in seasons of plenty. Faith in seasons of doubt. Patience in suffering. Peace in turmoil. Mercy when wronged. Gentleness when falsely accused. Strength in temptation. Humility in leadership and prayer in all seasons. We sang it, but we also see it in John 15 where Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Remain in me. Abide in me. The fourth point of this tree is its leaf does not wither. See, during the peak of summer, the grass can take on a dehydrated golden color as the scorching sun relentlessly cooks the earth. That's what happens. However, the blessed person, their roots go deep beneath the surface, drawing nourishment from waters provided by the gardener. When the world witnesses a person enduring scorching winds, yet still flourishing with vibrant leaves, there is only one explanation. His name is Jesus. But if the world looks to the church and goes, well, I have nothing to ask because you look exactly the same as me. Then again, I ask the question, where are we drawing water from? Where are we drawing nourishment? It's probably from the same place they are. Its leaf does not wither. Fifth one, it's the last one. The fifth point comes at the end of this verse. It says, whatever he does prospers. Now don't, don't misunderstand this verse like some have and take it to places that it was never meant to go. This doesn't mean that you're gonna have the Midas touch. Okay? Not everything you touch is gonna turn to gold. Not everything you do is gonna say, no, that's not, that's not what he's saying here. But rather, that the Hebrew word uh, 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 translated here, prosper, means to accomplish the work you set out to do. To, to make steady progress on your way to succeed. It's this idea of perseverance that you will endure, that you will keep your eyes on Jesus and you'll just keep going. Whatever he does prospers because at the end of it all, it's all for his glory. In some way, like we're gonna get there one day and, and, and man, he's gonna, he's gonna be seated on his throne and, and, and there's gonna be millions upon millions upon millions of, of God's people. And, and, and we're just gonna be, it's gonna be testimony after testimony after testimony. And after every single one, I, I really feel like, I really feel there's gonna be this, oh, moment where we're connecting the dots and going, that's what he was doing. Man, I'm so thankful that you remain faithful. It's like, oh, that's, like even in your own life, you'd be like, I now get what he was doing. According to the world, it didn't look like I won, but according to the kingdom of God, I won. Amen. And so my question is, are you a tree planted beside flowing streams? If not, then you're missing out on so many blessings that God has for you. Verse four. Oh, I'm gonna, I should call the band up. I'm call the band up. Almost done. Verse four. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now, the image here. Uh, it is one of a, a separating floor during harvest time, okay? I had to read about this because I'm a city guy. I'm a city man. I had no idea about this farming stuff, but it's, it's think, the separating floor uh, at a farm during harvest time. First, the, the, the heads of wheat were, were crushed to separate the kernel from the husk. Man, I hope you're seeing the picture here. Then it's tossed up in the air so that, that the wind would carry away the lighter parts. This is the chaff, while the heavy kernels, this is the stuff that, that's actually useful, it falls down to the ground. That's the picture that we're given. And so chaff is, is the, the light shell around a kernel of grain, which, which must be stripped away before the kernel of grain can, can be ground into flour. And so what we've been told here is that this chaff is, is essentially worthless. It's dead. It's without substance. And it's easily carried away. There's a huge difference between a tree and chaff. The same way there is a difference between a blessed person and one who is not. 
The psalmist calls this other person the wicked. Instead of being a, a solid tree, the wicked is an empty shell. An empty shell is not always obvious on the surface. It's not always obvious to see. Many, many, many who are like chef masquerade it well. They're so good at it that they even fool themselves. Because yeah, look, they do all the things. They do all the things. They, they, they attend church gatherings. They attend community groups. They read the Bible. They know all the stories. They sing the songs. And dare I even say, they give generously. And, and hear me, these are all good things. They're all good things. But if you use these things as the basis of your salvation, then they are horrible things. If I was to ask you on, on what basis are you saved and, and then you, you give your spiritual CV, then you are greatly mistaken. We should give the finished work of Jesus and the empty tomb. On what grounds am I a Christian? The finished work of Jesus and the empty tomb. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You know, we often see this as like the, the one who is not a believer, the one who is not a Christian, the one who has not surrendered at all to Jesus. They, well, they, they'll never get to heaven, and that's true. Because of the sin and the, and the shame and the judgment that is on them. That's true. But the other side is true is that like heaven, heaven is just going I, I don't know what to do with you I, I don't know what to do with you that's why you cannot you cannot be here the, 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 the one who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior cannot survive in heaven in the same way that, that, that a fish cannot survive on a tree it's just so outside of its elements it's like I, this is good it's exactly the same Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Friends, who are the righteous? Because I, I hope you want to be among the assembly of the righteous. H how do we ensure that we are among the righteous? And if you're asking this question, then you're asking the right question. And if you're not, then you need to be asking this question because this is the greatest question that you'll ever ask. How can I be righteous? Well, first need to understand what this word actually means because if you if you're new to the Bible and you're new to Christianity this is a word that's going to come up over and over and over and over and over again and so it's important that you understand what it means to be righteous hear this to be righteous means to be in right standing with God it's as simple as I can make it to be righteous is to be in right standing with God and so the question is who is in right standing with God spoiler alert no one oh but on there I've done this not good enough on it but I grew up in this not good enough on I went to this church not good enough on I, I I I know this 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 catechism I've, I was confirmed I I was I was not good enough no one is righteous well no one but Jesus only Jesus can, can stand before God and be like, I, I am in right standing with you. Perfect relationship with you. Perfect harmony. Perfect unity with you. Only Him. And so what does He do? Because He could have easily gone, well, all the best everyone. You know? I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to go and be with the Father and enjoy this, this abundant life. Shame. That's not what he does. No, no, no. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is known as the divine exchange. What does Jesus do? He steps down from heaven clothed in righteousness but then he, he takes it off and then he, he puts it on us but before doing that he takes our unrighteousness and he puts it on himself. Friends, I would, I would never do that for you. Let's just be honest. 
Because what do we do? Well, we, 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 we count. We go, well, you are good. But remember that time when you... Ooh, but I remember you posted that one thing. So, mm. And yet Jesus goes, he, he doesn't go, no, that stuff doesn't matter. No, 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 he takes it all into account. Your lies, your shame, your greed, your addiction, your hate, your bitterness, your unforgiveness. He takes it all and he, and he goes, you know what? I, I, let's, let's all put it here. And then he takes off his holiness and his righteousness and he, and he puts it on us and he takes ours and, and then he goes to the cross where the full wrath of God is poured out on him. Body broken, bloodshed. You know, in the same way that we take a wet rag and we, man, we twist it, we squeeze it, we crush it. Why? To get every bit of water out of that rag. Well, Jesus' body was twisted. It was crushed. So that every single drop of blood would be shed. And then he covers us with it. For every single person who believes that what Jesus did for them, counted for them, you are forgiven. And therefore declared righteous. And so for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. If you are in Christ, the Lord is watching over you. You are not alone. He is watching over you. We are told that Jesus right now, he's not in the tomb. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for, he, do you know he's praying for you by name? By circum, situation, circum, all of it, he knows it. He's like, I know what's going on, I'm praying for you. The Lord watches over you. But if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, it says here, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. You wanna ruin your life? Live the way of the wicked. You want to ruin your life? Turn away from God. You want to ruin your life? Don't obey Him. Jesus Christ is the true righteous man of Psalm 1. God blessed Him and prospered Him as our sinless Savior. If you belong to Him by surrendering your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, if that is you, then the blessings of Psalm 1 are yours too. If you belong to God through Jesus by the power of the Spirit, then Psalm 1 will be the pattern of your life. It will. It will be the soundtrack to your life. This is the only way to true happiness. It's the only way to true happiness. Don't believe, don't believe the lies of this world. Don't believe what they promise you on Instagram and Facebook. The kingdom of darkness is constantly advertising to us a different life. But cannot, cannot, cannot fulfill on any of those things. And yet God presents His Son Jesus to us and says this, this, this is life. He is life. And so my question to you as we begin this series is will you, will you come to Him? Will you come to Him? And so Father God, we pray. We pray asking that God, you, you would do a massive work in each and every one of our lives. That God, you know where every single person is. There are some in here who've been walking with you for years. They have testimony after testimony after testimony of your goodness. They read Psalm 1 and they amen it. And so God, would you continue to walk with them? Would you continue to grow them? Would you continue to be with them? And then there are those who've just crossed the line of faith, that they are, they are new to many of these things. Holy Spirit, I'm asking for your guidance and for your leading. Father, I'm so thankful that they're here, that, that, that they would consider plugging into a community of faith because we were never meant to live in isolation, but we were beautifully designed for fellowship. 
that this is just one of your many ways of growing us. And so would you give those a hunger for your word, a longing for you, a thirst for you. And then God, I pray for those who don't know you. And in our context, God, you know it's so much harder. For many of us, we we think we live in a Christian nation and so by virtue of that, we are Christians. We've sung the songs, we know the prayers, but, but realistically, we, we've just never bent the knee and made the confession. God, we know that there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That at the end of it all, that, that's the only response. We'll bend and we'll confess. But my prayer is that many would be bending and confessing in worship because of the salvation that they have received. It would not be the bending and confessing in judgment because they denied you. And so Father, I pray for those who don't know you, that you would draw them to you, that it would be so powerful and so profound that it's, it's, it's just irresistible. There's nothing that they can do but come, to come and say, Jesus, save me. I pray that in this room. God, protect us, watch over us. And as we stand and sing in response, we sing to a God who is seated on his throne, who is fully in control. We sing to a God who is matchless. We sing to a God who is undefeated. We sing to a God who is merciful, who is gracious, who is loving, who is kind. We sing to a God who has everything in his hands. Help us respond appropriately for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.